The first lesson is really pretty simple. Be careful what you get into. That takes me to the second lesson of a long war. Be careful what you get into, but be at least as careful over what you propose to get out of. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. I'm George Gillum. Our guest today is Ryan Crocker. Uh, ambassador Crocker is a career ambassador within the United States Foreign Service, and he's a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is America's highest civilian honor. Ambassador Crocker is, in the truest sense, a born internationalist. Uh, growing up, he lived in Morocco, Canada, and Turkey. He attended University College Dublin and earned his undergraduate degree in English literature at Whitman College in Washington State. After college, he joined the Foreign Service and after Persian language training, he was posted in Iran. He received intensive training in Arabic language and was assigned to Baghdad in 1978. In another posting in Lebanon, uh, he survived the Beirut embassy bombing. He served as United States Ambassador to Kuwait and as Ambassador to Syria, both postings under President Bill Clinton. Uh, he served as Ambassador to Pakistan during the George W. Bush administration and as Ambassador to Iraq under the Bush and Obama administrations. Of his service in the Middle East, President George W. Bush called him America's Lawrence of Arabia. In April 2009, Ambassador Crocker retired after 37 years in the nation's service. Ryan Crocker is now the Dean and Executive Professor in the George W. Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. His topic today, lessons from a long war, Iraq, Afghanistan, and history. Please welcome Ambassador Crocker. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, Governor Belisles, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a joke. Um, there was a, a survivor of the um, uh, Johnstown flood who ever after kind of made his living speaking about the experience. Uh, he, he eventually passed on to his reward, and uh, when he entered the pearly gates, uh, uh, he was told that it was a custom for a new arrival to um, uh, uh, address the hosts of heaven on a topic of um, uh, his or her choosing. And the, uh, the flood survivors said, well, I'll, I'll speak on what I've always spoken. I'll speak about surviving the great flood. Um, and Gabriel said, uh, that's, uh, that's fine, but you should know that uh, Noah is in the audience. <laughs> uh, 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 this, this morning, Professor Ramazani is in the audience. Uh, uh, um, lessons from a long war. I, as I look back on my um, uh, long and checkered past, uh, I often think in terms of a, of a long war. For, for most Americans, the, the war on terror, uh, of course, started on 9-11, when terror from the broader Middle East uh, reached our shores. Um, I, I take a somewhat longer perspective. Um, I, I was in Beirut, as uh, George noted, uh, in the early 80s. I was there for the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. I was uh, there for the, um, the bombing of the embassy and the marine barracks in 1983. So as I pursued my career in the broader Middle East, uh, uh, I did so in the shadow of those events. Uh, so that's, that's one way, it's one way of framing a long war from a US perspective. There, there is another way, though, um, of framing the same context, and that's from a Middle Eastern perspective. Um, 
Americans are a great people. This is a great country, the greatest on earth, I think. But we do have our limitations, and one of them is an understanding of history. We, we tend to be ahistorical. Uh, we didn't build this country by looking back, by reviewing our yesterdays. It was all about getting on with today and tomorrow. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great quality, but it can also be a great disadvantage because as you engage in complex areas of the world, they do have histories. Uh, and histories shape the present. Uh, they're a guidepost to the future. Uh, as a great power, we are very fortunate in the fact that all of our games basically are away games. Uh, we play on other people's fields and other people's stadia. Um, uh, and if you do that, though, it is very helpful to know other people's ground rules, um, how they read, how they understand, how they interpret history. And if you extend that long war metaphor uh, into the region, uh, it goes back much farther than Lebanon in 1983. Um, I'll um, give you a date, uh, 1798. Uh, most Americans have no idea what happened in the Middle East uh, in 1798 that is relevant. Uh, well, 1798 was the year that Napoleon Bonaparte invaded and occupied Egypt. Uh, now, be honest, most of you had no idea that <laughs> Bonaparte invaded and occupied Egypt. He, he had to fill up some time between major European engagements. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, off he went. He wasn't there very long. Uh, uh, the British followed him. Uh, but arguably, it was a date and an event that launched an era in Middle Eastern and Western relations in which we still dwell. Uh, because from 1798 on, as you look at the broader Middle East, uh, from Morocco in the West, all the way through Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, in the East, uh, every single one of those countries was invaded and occupied uh, by at least one Western power over those 200 plus years. Not just those countries, of course. Uh, it was the era of empire. Uh, but it is uh, a unique feature of uh, Middle Eastern history and political culture that we do well to remember. Uh, because I, I would suggest to you that it has created, among other things, a distinctive um, Middle Eastern political culture. Uh, peoples of that area learned a long time ago that you can't really keep out the large, well-trained, well-equipped armies of the West uh, through force on force. It just isn't going to work. They're going to roll right over you. Um, so let them come. They're coming anyway. And once they're in, uh, uh, you regroup, you reorganize, resupply, move in, clinch up, start pounding on their ribs, and see how much pain they can take over how long. Uh, in other words, for the region, uh, in a regional context, uh, adversaries there don't really begin to fight until some time after the West thinks it's won the war. Uh, uh, and, and you see this again, um, insurgencies in Morocco and Algeria against the French. Uh, the Italians had their problems in Libya. Uh, the British and the Russians in Afghanistan. The Israelis in Lebanon. The Americans in Lebanon. Uh, and of course, the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so again, uh, a long war uh, viewed differently by the West and the Middle East. Um, and that takes me, um, after about 10 minutes of exhaustive introduction, to just, just the first lesson of a long war that I've absorbed. Lest you panic, there really are only two. Uh, <laughs> but take notes. I expect you to remember this. It's a, uh, uh, the first lesson is really pretty simple. Be careful what you get into. Uh, 
uh, under, if, if you are planning a major initiative, um, and no initiative is more major than a military intervention, uh, you need to thoroughly understand the context of um, the area in which you propose to play that extended away game. Uh, so you need to know that history, uh, uh, the history of a long war of complex relations with the West. Uh, and you need to know it uh, not simply as we may write it, although if you do know that, you're going to be ahead of approximately 98% of your countrymen. Um, uh, you need to know it as it is perceived in the region. And the narrative of history uh, in the broader Middle East reads rather differently uh, than as we record it in the West. Um, there, there's a great book. Um, I, I'm sure all of you in the UVA community are, are starved for reading suggestions. Uh, so, so, so here's another one. Um, uh, it's by the uh, Franco-Lebanese writer Amin Malouf, and it's called The Crusades Through Arab Eyes. Uh, and what uh, Amin Malouf has done is simply told the story of the Crusades, uh, relying only on uh, chroniclers from the region, uh, both contemporary and later. And not really a surprise uh, that those Crusades don't look a thing like the Crusades you may have studied in high school or college. Um, so know the history. Know how the history informs the, presence, uh, the present in the minds of the people you're going to be dealing with. Uh, and again, to you know, beat the long war metaphor absolutely to death, uh, for many in the Middle East, um, that long war goes back to the Crusades. Uh, it is much more um, a series of living events in Middle Eastern eyes, uh, the, uh, the narrative of Western military intervention uh, and attempts at dominance uh, than it is in the West. Um, so that, that, that should be part of your chronicle. Uh, so know the history. Uh, know how that history is perceived in the theater of operations you propose to enter. Uh, but know more than that. Uh, uh, know the culture. Above all, know the language. Um, and, and here again, this is a challenge for Americans. Uh, because by and large, if we tend to be ahistorical, we are also <coughs> relentlessly monolingual. Um, um, you know, and if, if the foreigners don't understand what you're trying to say, just say it slower and louder, and you know, <laughs> eventually they're going to get it. Uh, uh, and I just make a plug for my, um, uh, my former business, uh, the, um, the Foreign Service of the United States. Um, we're pretty small. There are only about 6,400 um, uh, generalist Foreign Service officers, popularly known as diplomats. Um, but every single one of them is professionally fluent in at least one foreign language, meaning he or she is able to do the business of our country in that language. Uh, it's not a requirement for entry, uh, but it is a requirement uh, to remain in the Foreign Service. And uh, I would just make a plug um, uh, for any of you whose um, uh, children and grandchildren are not yet settled on a vocation or avocation, and it really is time for them to get out of your basement. Uh, uh, <laughs> T tell them to think about the Foreign Service exam. Uh, three times a year, takes up one Saturday of their lives. It's absolutely free. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Foreign Service has often been uh, the, uh, the province of uh, uh, the Ivy League and some of the big West Coast schools uh, simply because other Americans just don't know what's out there. Uh, but that's my plug. Um, Go take the Foreign Service exam, learn a language, and then deploy to that long war. Um, uh, and, and again, I cannot uh, underscore too heavily the importance of language. It's not simply um, a case of transactional translation, where one word equals another. Uh, 
language is for all of you who are fluent in, in a foreign language, uh, no, it is a window into how other people think, perceive, analyze, assess, and ultimately act. Uh, uh, so under that, again, general rubric of being careful what you get into, uh, uh, know the history, uh, know the language, know the culture, uh, know the literature. And, and this is more simply than uh, the history or the, um, uh, the political writing of the day. Uh, know the fiction, know the poetry. Uh, many Middle Eastern cultures uh, pay much more attention to imaginative literature than we do, and in particular to poetry. Uh, but knowing that literature, and particularly knowing the myths uh, of Middle Eastern society, and knowing the fairy tales, what, what stories do parents tell their children in these cultures? Because it will tell you a great deal about, uh, again, the values, uh, uh, the enduring principles that motivate a society and a people. So know those things. Um, and then know what you don't know, what you can't know. Um, um, there isn't a person alive today who can say, well, events have unfolded in Iraq over seven and a half years exactly as I predicted. Uh, everything that has happened was what I said would happen at the end of 2002. That person doesn't exist. Uh, uh, not in government, God knows, but not in academia, uh, not in journalism. Uh, because entering into a major engagement in a long war um, means dealing not just with third and fourth order consequences, it's dealing with 20th and 30th order consequences. Uh, Huge forces are set in motion that over time set other huge forces in motion and so on down the line. Um, so I think we have to be very, uh, very clear-eyed and a little bit modest about the degree of uncertainty and risk that we're taking on in a major endeavor such as a military intervention. Uh, the uh, previous administration was faulted for not having adequately planned for post-conflict uh, contingencies in Iraq with great justification. But the hard truth is no amount of planning uh, uh, could have prepared us for all that befell in a complex contingency like Iraq. So uh, part of that lesson uh, of being careful what you get into has to be an assessment uh, based not, on, not only on everything you can learn and you can know, uh, but accepting there is going to be an even greater deal that you don't and can't know, um, can't begin to predict, so it becomes an assessment. Um, how much of the great unknown, how much risk are you prepared to absorb in exchange for the goals and the risks uh, that you can foresee and believe you can achieve. So uh, another calculation um, uh, uh, and another part of that lesson of being careful what you get into uh, in a long war. Um, that takes me to the second lesson of a long war. Be careful what you get into, but be at least as careful over what you propose to get out of. Uh, uh, once you have set these forces in motion, uh, uh, there can be even graver consequences of saying, OK, that didn't play out quite like I had hoped, so um, we're out of here. Um, uh, again, Fairly early in my career, I had that uh, experience in Lebanon. Um, the administration at the time, although it didn't say so publicly, thought that the 1982 Israeli invasion would be a positive game changer. Um, uh, get rid of the PLO, uh, which had a mini state in the south, uh, rock the Syrians back, 
Um, and um, maybe, just maybe, uh, you can reposition the deck chairs and uh, move on to a broader Middle East peace settlement. Uh, well, it didn't play out that way um, exactly, uh, as I saw firsthand. Um, uh, those unintended consequences spooled out for us the creation of Hezbollah um, in the second half of 1982, <clears throat> uh, then the bombings. Um, uh, we got out in 1984, of course. It was a sad, tragic chapter in American history, but it was over, except it wasn't. Um, uh, Hezbollah is with us today. Its backers, Iran and Syria, uh, absorbed a lesson about the United States that continues to guide their policy. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Um, uh, can't keep them out, let them come in, regroup, reorganize, move back, and see how much pain they can take. Um, we were out in 84. The Israelis lasted a good bit longer, but eventually they got out too uh, without achieving any of those grand goals. Uh, uh, when I arrived in Iraq at the beginning of 2007, it looked very uncomfortably like the Lebanon I had left a quarter of a century before. Uh, Syria was on stage uh, supporting Sunni insurgents uh, and Al-Qaeda infiltrators from the West. Uh, Iran was supporting extremist Shia militias like Jaysh al-Mahdi, the army of the Mahdi, uh, which looked an awful lot like Hezbollah. And at the beginning of 2007, the calculations in Tehran and Damascus clearly were we did it to them once in Lebanon, and now we're going to do it again to them in Iraq. Um, except it didn't work out that way. Um, instead of stepping back, as they had expected, we actually stepped forward uh, with the, um, the new way forward in Iraq, uh, popularly known as the surge. And it did turn out to be a game changer, uh, not in and of itself, but it set in motion, again, a chain of events, some of which we could foresee, others of which we just hoped for, and some of which we had no idea would, uh, would follow. But a vicious circle became a virtuous spiral because of the surge. Uh, the uh, Syrians, and especially the Iranians, had a really bad couple of years in Iraq. Uh, as uh, Sunnis turned against al-Qaeda, Shia noted the change, recalculated their own uh, reliance on an extremist militia, uh, creating a political climate in which the prime minister of Iraq could use his own forces against an Iranian-backed Shia militia, as he did in early 2008, and succeed. Uh, uh, so again, careful getting in be just as careful or more careful about saying, we're done here. And that, that was the theme, of course, of the testimony that uh, General Petraeus and I provided to, uh, uh, to Congress at truly extraordinary length in uh, just exactly three years ago, September uh, 2007. Uh, you don't like the way it's going in Iraq, uh, costing way too much in blood and treasure. Uh, you know, we got that. You know, we understand. We're, we're out there with it. Uh, but you need to understand that disengagement brings with it its own set of consequences. And if you didn't like the first three reels of the Iraq movie, uh, the next 27 reels uh, that are going to spool out with us off stage and out of the cast uh, are going to be really unpleasant. So think about it. Um, uh, we did think about it. Uh, we did uh, stay the course. Now we're in a withdrawal phase, uh, leaving enormous challenges, uh, but also some hope. What I worry about now, as I look at Iraq, um, is that uh, we as Americans uh, think we've turned the page, uh, that Iraq now is well and truly done. Uh, 
not great, but better than we expected a few years ago. Now let's really move on. Um, but that's, again, where the desynchronization of Middle Eastern and American clocks, I think, becomes so apparent. Uh, uh, the American clock always runs faster than Middle Eastern clocks. Um, uh, again, it's the American impatience that built the country. We, we, we want solutions. We want them now. We'll give you to the day after tomorrow. If it isn't done then, we're moving on. Uh, and that is a dynamic, uh, again, in a long war that our allies have come to fear from us and our adversaries have come to count on. Uh, we'll wait them out. Uh, and you see this again in Iraq. There were, there were two polls last week that I thought were very telling. Um, uh, a CBS poll found that 70% of Americans at the time of the president's speech uh, thought that Iraq had been a horrible mistake and we just needed to turn the chapter, close the door, and get out. Uh, same week, a poll in Iraq found that 70% of Iraqis, exactly the same percentage, thought that an American withdrawal would be a huge mistake. Uh, two different clocks, two different sets of assessments. So as we move forward, I hope very much uh, that we realize this is a long war, not always fought mercifully uh, by force of arms, but our engagement in Iraq over the long term is going to be very important to the prospects for long-term stability in that key country. Uh, I negotiated two agreements before my departure, a security agreement that sets the timetable for full withdrawal in 2011, uh, uh, but also a strategic framework agreement uh, that provides literally the framework to order our relations with Iraq in all fields, uh, security, economy, uh, political, diplomatic, educational, scientific, and so forth. Uh, I hope very much that this administration, as it draws down forces, uh, will provide the resources and the engagement to lead to full implementation of the Strategic Framework Agreement and not simply uh, turn the page. Uh, if Iraq succeeds in stabilizing as a pluralistic and stable society, uh, you will have something of a Middle Eastern game changer because Iraq, since the 1958 revolution, uh, has been a constant source of danger and instability uh, in the region uh, and to the West, uh, uh, especially the US. We, we have the potential of changing that, but again, it will require uh, sustained US engagement. I expect when a new government is formed, uh, sometime late this year, that government is going to come to us and say, uh, guys, you know that agreement that that idiot Crocker negotiated that calls for all US forces to be out of Iraq by 2011? Um, why don't we rethink that? Um, why don't we see if we can move this to something like a Korea model, where you're there, you're there in substantial numbers, um, you're not taking casualties, you're not in combat, but you provide the essential stability uh, guarantee to all parties and the caution to Iraq's neighbors uh, uh, that they can't simply walk back in. Uh, I, I think there's a good prospect Iraqis will do that. Uh, I hope very much we will listen very carefully because, again, it's a long war. The, uh, Iranians had a bad couple of years, but they haven't moved. They still share that same border. And we're already seeing indications of <clears throat> the Iranians retooling, uh, re-engaging, and telling the Iraqis, um, hey, the Americans are going. We're still here. Uh, we remember. Uh, so again, our counterweight is going to be very important for a very long time. Let, let me just shift um, quickly, and in doing so, because of time constraints, I pass over uh, Iran necessarily. I hope we can deal with that in questions. Um, to Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, here again, you see the lessons of history play out. Um, 
And it's interesting to me as uh, someone who has been through this process um, <clears throat> that we don't have to look too far back in history. Um, we were deeply strategically engaged in Afghanistan um, not that long ago in historical terms. Uh, the decade of the 80s, uh, the decade of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan saw a sustained U.S. effort and commitment uh, to force the Soviets out. We, we didn't use our conventional forces. Uh, we used a variety of other tools of state, statecraft. Uh, we worked very closely with key regional allies, especially Pakistan, from which the anti-Soviet jihad was staged, and it worked. Soviets left in 1989. The Americans left in 1990. Uh, our work there was done. Um, we could foresee uh, the vicious Afghan civil war that was going to ensue as dramatically uh, inharmonious factions of the Afghan resistance, no longer unified by a common enemy, began to prepare to square off against each other. Uh, but that wasn't our affair. The Afghan civil war did play out in a horrifically brutal fashion without us. It led eventually to the emergence of the Taliban, uh, who um, made a real estate offer to Al-Qaeda uh, then in Africa that um, Al-Qaeda found very attractive. And the rest, as they say, is history in the road to 9-11. Uh, in Pakistan, of course, we also disengaged. And in the course of one year, uh, Pakistan, in their narrative of history, went from being the most allied of US allies to the most sanctioned of US adversaries. Because uh, not only did we pull out our assets and resources, we slapped sanctions on them because of their nuclear weapons program, the Pressler Amendment uh, of 1990. That ended all economic and security assistance to Pakistan. We had known about their nuclear program for the previous 16 years because then Prime Minister Bhutto announced it. Uh, but because of the needs of the moment, we were ready to set that aside until we didn't need to set it aside any longer. So again, we were done. History rolled on. Now we're back. Uh, and in Pakistan, where I was ambassador, uh, I saw the legacy of history. A constant refrain was, well, you're back. That's great. Uh, uh, when's your return ticket for? Uh, how long are you going to be here this time? And what are you going to leave us with when you go again? Uh, so you ask us if we're hedging our bets with the Taliban? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you're right. We are hedging our bets. Uh, uh, now, sometimes your enemy is your objective ally. Uh, the emergence of uh, Pakistani Taliban and its horrific attacks directly on the state, including its security forces, um, has uh, narrowed Islamabad's options. Uh, but the basic uh, issue remains. Uh, uh, we're in. We're talking about getting out. We're talking about timelines to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistanis, as well as Afghan allies, look at that and say, there they go again. Uh, uh, so as we, we talk about these issues, we have to remember there are regional audiences, both friends and foes, who listen very carefully to what we say. And I worry that as they watch our current national debate over Afghanistan, uh, uh, that they are drawing conclusions that are harmful, ultimately, to our own vital national security interests. Uh, I applaud the current administration, uh, their close work with Congress in structuring a $7.5 billion five-year security and economic assistance program to Pakistan. Uh, that sends the signal of a long-term commitment. Uh, and I hope very much that we maintain it. We have a particular crisis to deal with at the moment uh, with the devastating floods uh, that have affected uh, a huge proportion of Pakistan, an area the size of the state of Florida, uh, with, with awful consequences. When I was uh, ambassador in Islamabad, the uh, Kashmir earthquake of 2005 struck. It killed 80,000 
Pakistanis in about four minutes. Uh, we, we responded with the largest and longest uh, humanitarian airborne assistance mission since the Berlin Airlift. Uh, and that did two things of lasting consequence. Uh, it went a huge distance to re-knitting our relationship of confidence uh, with the Pakistani military, who carried the main brunt for Pakistan in that earthquake relief effort. Uh, and it profoundly affected the attitudes of people in the earthquake zone, uh, which is also the northwest frontier in uh, Pakistani Kashmir. Overall attitudes in Pakistan shifted toward us, then they shifted back. But in that particular sensitive area, we continue to be well and favorably remembered for what we did in their time of need. There is now another strategic challenge and opportunity born of these floods. I hope very much uh, that the administration and the American people again step forward in a, uh, uh, a way that turns a tragedy into the opportunity to show uh, a steadfast US commitment to an ally at a time of need. So again, a great deal more to talk about. I look forward to discussing that when this monologue becomes a dialogue, uh, which begins approximately right now. Uh, 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 thank you for your attendance on an absolutely beautiful day when I think we'd all rather be outside, but here you are anyway. Uh, and I, I just would commend to you those two lessons uh, and their necessary corollary uh, for that third thing that Americans don't have in uh, great supply. Um, ahistorical, monolingual, and impatience. Uh, uh, this region requires our long-term strategic patience, uh, an ability to reset the, the Washington clock to more closely track the Baghdad, Kabul, and Islamabad clocks and of course the tribal areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan where there are no clocks. Uh, uh, with that, I very much do have my eye to George's immense relief on our clock and um, I think we can now move into the next phase. So. Mr. Ambassador, in some of your congressional testimony, you used a metaphor that I, I love. It's dramatic uh, and to the point. You said, you don't get cracks and fissures in a rock until you bring a hammer down on it. Um, in determining uh, whether and when to bring the hammer down on a uh, regime uh, like Iran that's thumbing its nose at the international community, and as far as we know, developing uh, weapons-grade fissionable material. Uh, what factors should our president consider? And if this president were to conclude it was necessary to launch a preemptive strike against Iran, what do you think would be the likely consequences to our standing in the Middle East and in the larger international community? <laughs> Well, that'll take the next 25 minutes. Uh, um, uh, you know, I kind of tossed that out there. We could talk about Iran in the question period. I didn't mean you to take that so literally. Well, for, first, let me clarify. Uh, in uh, congressional te testimony, when I talked about bringing the hammer down to uh, create cracks and fissures, um, in a um, heretofore monolithic adversary. I, I was not talking about um, Operation Iraqi Freedom and the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime. I was talking about the surge and its effect on the insurgency. Uh, that the insurgency was going to hang together and feel like it was on a roll uh, until we did something through the use of force, the surge, that uh, brought that hammer down and changed their calculations. And again, that is kind of how it played out. Uh, as they ran into our force and determination, they recalculated uh, their odds, and we began to uh, find ways with 
uh, Iraqis to start picking it apart. That's the same logic, of course, in Afghanistan, uh, that uh, the surge there intended to reshape the Taliban's strategic calculations and allow us to start disaggregating them. Uh, in terms of Iran, um, if Iraq has been hard uh, with its 25 plus million people, if Afghanistan has been harder with its 25 plus million people, I invite you to contemplate Iran. Um, Professor Ramazani, the current population of Iran is? 73. 73 million people. Yeah. Um, uh, over a geographically highly diverse country with a long and strong history, again, history, of deep allergy to foreign intervention. Uh, the Mossadegh experience in the early 50s uh, profoundly shapes Iranian attitudes to this day. So if anyone is thinking um, that uh, military intervention in Iran is a good idea, I would invite you to go out and sit under one of those beautiful shady trees uh, until the thought passes from your head. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are two options for Iran that begin with an A, um, neither of which do I think are terribly good, uh, attack and acquiesce. Um, uh, those who contemplate an attack uh, say, well, you know, it'd be a nifty kind of air or air assault operation, sort of like what the Israelis did to Iraq's Osirak um, uh, reactor about 30 years ago. Yeah, that's great if you can do it. Uh, but the Iranians have had 30 years to study what the Israelis did um, in, um, in Iraq. And whatever they're doing in Iran is clearly designed and structured uh, to be very difficult to wipe out from, from the air or via air assault means. Uh, and what has surfaced shows a very interesting redundancy um, of effort, and obviously we don't know the whole thing. And you do want to consider that um, um, if a nuclearly armed Iran uh, is a grave danger to the region and the world, there is one thing worse, worse, and that would be an Iran with nuclear weapons that we or our allies tried with military means to prevent them from having. Uh, uh, so uh, if you think you can do it by military means, uh, it had better be more than a thought. Uh, it had better be an absolute conviction. And I, you know, I'm not privy to in, any inside information, but um, I doubt that it's, that, that conviction is anywhere near there. Um, uh, what um, uh, I do believe is that we need to continue uh, along the path we're on. In, in diplomacy, buying time is sometimes the only good investment you can make. Um, so delay, disrupt, uh, penalize, uh, the Iranian economy is not exactly thriving. Uh, uh, extract economic pain uh, as a result of their pursuance of a nuclear program. Uh, work uh, hard to make this not a US, Iran, or an Israeli, Iran issue, but an international issue. I think both the Bush and the Obama administrations have uh, done this reasonably well. Uh, work to keep the Security Council together. Uh, work to find levers with the Chinese and the Russians, as hard as that can be, um, and buy time. Um, because here's my other cheerful thought for, for a beautiful Friday morning. Um, and this also, I think, um, uh, draws from a sense of history. Uh, Iran has always been a regional superpower. You can take that as far back as you want. Um, uh, the Safavids, for example. Uh, uh, the Shah uh, projected power beyond his borders. He used his uh, army in the Arabian Peninsula in the early 70s. Uh, he used his navy to seize islands from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, that wasn't the mullahs. That, that was the Shah. Uh, the Islamic Republic has also projected power beyond its borders by unconventional means rather than conventional. Again, Hezbollah. 
uh, support for, for Hamas. Uh, what that tells me is that it doesn't matter who rules in Tehran. Uh, the, the search for a nuclear weapon will be a strategic priority. They have a nuclear power to their east in Pakistan, uh, an undeclared power to their west in Israel. This is consistent with Iranian geostrategic thinking. Um, uh, so it is not, in my view, a whim of the mad mullahs. Uh, uh, this is deeply rooted uh, strategic philosophy. Uh, so again, as we look at a range of not very good options, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the only one that makes sense is, uh, is that very hard one uh, of, uh, again, delay, disrupt, and buy time. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for a wonderful presentation. Especially, I uh, enjoyed the pee into the Foreign Service and the importance of it and the study of languages. Let me press you back to the, thirst of the substance of your primary address, though, Iraq and Afghanistan, and assume we exercise that remarkably un-American uh, characteristic of patience. We don't have it. Uh, we also have another problem, don't we? And that is we're running out of money, or perceive that we do. We haven't paid for this war. What do you think the end game, the practical end game, will be if we are able to continue to trudge on this path uh, in Iraq, where we says, say we've stopped combat operations, and Afghanistan, where we really want to try to see if something good can come out of it? Uh, it, it, thanks for introducing the economic dimension because um, it, it is important. And there are some uh, analysts and commentators who kind of liken the current moment in history to the, the moment after World War II uh, in which we were uh, prepared to hand back primary responsibility, particularly in the Middle East, uh, to the British. Uh, uh, and the British said, we can't do it anymore. We are bled white. Uh, this has to now be America's moment. And then the extension of that uh, argument is, America is now bled white. Um, we can't sustain these interventions any longer, but there's no America to pass it on to. Um, uh, this requires, I think, sober thought and sober debate. I, I saw a piece. Um, a few weeks ago in the New York Times that uh, uh, looked at the costs of Iraq and Afghanistan, compared them in relative terms to the costs of other major interventions, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and said, you know, guess what? In percentage terms, uh, this is a tiny fraction, uh, not only of the financial uh, obligations of World War II, which was a world war, but uh, you know, proportionate and maybe even less in terms of the commitments in, um, in say, Korea and Vietnam in, in absolute terms. So I think, again, we would want a very sober, very careful, very detailed look at how much does this cost in real terms? What are the trend lines in those costs? Clearly, the trend line in Iraq is going down substantially. We'll go down further as uh, Iraqi uh, uh, oil uh, potential comes increasingly online. Um, and then you look at alternative costs. If we say we really can't afford it or we really don't want to afford it, uh, well, what are the costs likely to be going forward of, again, disengagement? Because um, I, I think you can have the same discussion we've just had on a political level and shift it over to the economic dimension. Uh, uh, engagement's expensive. Um, sustained engagement is even more expensive, but you can't assume that disengagement means your expenses go away. What are the possible and probable costs of disengagement uh, if things don't go our way? Uh, how much could we be paying later and for what? Uh, again, uh, I take you back to Afghanistan uh, the disengagement of the 90s um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the costs now that we uh, have had to assume today in both blood and treasure, the costs of 
Um, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, great service to this country. Um, I wonder if you could accept a point of dissent about the historical dating of 1798, as you mentioned, the invasion of Egypt by Napoleon. I was born in Spain. I am an American citizen. And the Arabs uh, invaded Spain in the year 700. And they were there for 700 years until 1942. In fact, in the, the, the year, um, in the century, in the ninth century, they were very close to Paris. And they almost conquered Europe. And I will be speaking Arab right now. The Turks, um, Muslims, uh, they were at the gates of Austria in the 18th century. Um, so I wonder if um, you could consider that. You know, the Crusades only lasted 200 years, 200, 300 years, from 11, 1100 to the 1300. So I feel as if uh, the, the Middle East, uh, who was the uh, caliphate of Damascus that really sponsored the invasion of Spain, were the first ones that fired the first shot. I mean, Spain is a European country. And it, that was, so I wonder if you would consider moving the date to the year 700. Um, <laughs> and it's great to bring in the broad sweep of history. Um, uh, you know, the, the conquest of the, um, uh, the early Arabs uh, through, um, uh, through Spain and into France, the um, ascendancy of the Ottoman Empire, as you note, at the gates of Damascus, at the gates of Vienna, um, uh, the Crusades. There are lots of um, points to pick. Uh, I, I, I picked 1798 because um, another one, I think it was uh, the Treaty of Kachuk Kanarji, 1776. That, that, that was also um, some contemporary historians will look at that date. It's, it's the modern era, uh, if you will. The, uh, uh, the modern dynamic of uh, the industrialized nation states of the West uh, uh, playing all those away games in the broader Middle East. Uh, but for any of you who have spent time in the region, uh, you will hear references uh, uh, all the way back to uh, 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 through the Ottoman conquest, uh, uh, through the Crusades, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, the days of Tariq bin Ziyad in Spain. And uh, uh, the, the Arabs may be gone, but their names remain. Uh, uh, Gibraltar, of course, is uh, Jebel Tariq. Uh, the mountain of Tarak after that uh, first successful invader. But I, I, I picked 1798 because uh, uh, that, I would argue, is the era we are still in. Um, um, you know, we've been through the world wars. We've seen the Cold War end. Uh, we have seen the geostrategic nature of the world change after the fall of the Soviet Union in so many ways. I would argue in the Middle East, uh, we are still in the same uh, geostrategic and political dynamic that kicked off in 1798. Uh, um, that's the beginning, in my view, of the modern era um, of a much older period of interaction and confrontation between the East and the West. Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you very much for your uh, comments, particularly your thoughtful comments uh, at the beginning about the importance of uh, understanding local cultures and different conceptions of history and time. Um, I did, however, think that, that those comments might be a bit in tension, in tension with your suggestion later that uh, the, the surge was the decisive turning point or a turning point in uh, in developments in the American occupation of Iraq. Um, my understanding is that it was actually uh, local events and, and, and uh, decisive breaks with local factions, uh, between local factions and Al Qaeda in Iraq that, that, that was actually decisive in, in marking a big turnaround. The, the surge certainly helped to consolidate many of those gains, but uh, when you're pouring thousands of troops and, and more resources into a country, wh when is that not going to help you consolidate gains? Uh, and so I was wondering, uh, th that's something that, that never seems to come out in the national narrative or debate about this. It seems to be accepted um, even by the most 
uh, nuanced commentators that, that the surge worked. And so I, I was just wondering, my question is, uh, is it a, at our peril to continue to believe that uh, success or failure in the region uh, is dependent on uh, American commitment or Western commitment alone and, and without attention to those local details that you uh, so wisely pointed to in the beginning of your talk. Thank you. Okay, we got to the question. Uh, um, look, in, in, a, in, in 35 minutes, you necessarily compress. Um, again, uh, Iraq is enormously complicated. Many, many factors went into the pre- and post-surge environment. Um, uh, tribes had moved against al-Qaeda beginning in 2005 in western Anbar and literally got their heads handed to them. Um, uh, because there was nobody to back them up, and al-Qaeda was on a roll. Al-Qaeda's excesses, uh, uh, 05, 06, uh, had caused huge resentments among the population, and by the fall of 2006, you had sheikhs in um, central Anbar ready to stand up. Uh, we stood up with them. Uh, one a significant sheikh in the Ramadi area had an American tank parked in front of his house. October 2006, before the surge. Uh, but what I would suggest is the surge was critical um, in broadening the awakening movement uh, as Sunni Arabs uh, throughout Anbar and in Baghdad said, the Americans are really here. Uh, timing is critical in these, uh, uh, in these matters. Uh, our timing was right in the sense that Al-Qaeda and its excesses had turned a population largely against them. But I, I would still suggest to you, we would not have seen um, that awakening proceed in its scope or at its pace. Um, and we might not have seen it uh, survive to make a difference in the overall political dynamic in, in Iraq um, if we weren't there in significant force. So, Again, it's a combination of many factors, and that, that would, I think, be my response to, um, uh, to your, uh, your question. Um, is US intervention always going to be decisive? Is it also ne always necessary? Take you back to my first lesson. Be careful what you get into. Uh, you, you've got to analyze it. Um, uh, what are we dealing with? What effect will our intervention have? Uh, in that country, in the region around it, and the international community. What are the factors at work? Who are our allies? Who are our adversaries? Um, sometimes the answer, I think, is going to be yes, we need to intervene. Other times, it may be just can't get there from here. But you, you've got to go through that very careful, measured process. Um, that, that's, again, the, the point of be careful what you get into. Um. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to Miller Center. And um, my question is uh, simple, if you'll allow me to go back to Iraq um, and take the opportunity of your presence. Um, it's, it's a very simple question. Was ever the reinstallment of the Hashemite kingdom or the Hashemite uh, family in Iraq along with democracy? ever seriously considered? Thank you. Uh, not by me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, certainly, we were in touch uh, in the 2002-2003 period with a range of um, uh, uh, dissident Iraqi political figures. Uh, and that included uh, members of the Hashemite uh, family. Um, uh, they were part of the political discourse, but uh, as we moved into the post-invasion period, it became pretty clear pretty fast that they, they simply did not have uh, weight or broad popularity. And uh, really by, uh, by this time, uh, seven years ago, uh, after some effort to, to step forward, they pretty well vanished from the scene. 
Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much for um, coming. As a student, I just want to say it's fantastic to have such a knowledgeable resource as yourself give insight and your firsthand account. So my question is on um, when you're saying that we need to stay until we have a synchronization, so to speak, of clocks, of Middle Eastern clocks with our own, um, what needs to happen in order for that synchronization to occur? Is it uh, you know, institutionalizing democratic pra practices, strengthening um, and integrating economies, and even if that is to happen, that checklist is, you know, taken care of, wouldn't we still need to maintain a presence in order to balance other regional powers, such as Iran, whose interests may oppose our own? Uh, my, my little bumper sticker for what is required, whether you're looking at Iraq or Afghanistan, is uh, good enough governance. Uh, Good enough governance, in, in my view, doesn't mean that either uh, society has been able to construct the shining city um, on the hill, um, a living paragon of diplomatic, uh, dip democratic ideals and practice. It means good enough uh, in the sense of giving the people who are governed the sense uh, that they have a government uh, that takes their views into account and delivers the basics, basic services, most fundamentally, basic security. Uh, doesn't mean you have a vibrant economy, uh, but that you do have an economic and social situation in when par where parents can start to believe that life may not be better for them, but that it will be better for their children. Um, uh, on a security level, it means um, national security forces um, that have not created universal calm in the country, but can deal themselves with whatever challenge emerges. Uh, I think we're we're pretty close to that right now in Iraq. Uh, you know, we're, we haven't been in the fight for in any significant way for months. Uh, the Iraqis are able to handle this themselves. So. It's that sort of good enough governance. Uh, and then with regard to the second part of your question, uh, we need to take the long view in consultation um, uh, with the, the states involved. And that's the point I was trying to make about US military in Iraq beyond the end of 2011, where uh, we are an assurance, um, a guarantee, if you will, both in an internal sense, but also vis-a-vis -vis strong and potentially hostile neighbors. Uh, in the case of Iraq, I'll tell you, I mean, we are going to be there because their major weapon systems that they're acquiring, acquiring from us, M1A2 tanks and F-16s, will not even be delivered uh, until, I think, 2013. So uh, in, in terms of a capacity to uh, have a credible strategic air deterrent, uh, that's going to have to be us. So again, uh, uh, we need to be both realistic in our ambitions, uh, good enough governance, uh, and strategic in our longer term thinking uh, as to the difference our presence can make not only in a national but a regional context. We have time for one last question, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, that, your comments, Mr. Ambassador, they just to transition pretty well into my question about good enough governance. Um, you mentioned also patience or lack thereof in the American psyche. One of the things, if you read op-ed pieces and such, that's trying American patience is the perceived lack of a credible partner in Afghanistan and the Karzai government and the sites of suitcases full of cash flying to Dubai or Geneva or, how would, you, how would you respond to that? How can we continue to stay in Afghanistan and um, as you seem to be recommending um, if, if we do not have a credible partner? Or, or do you think that the Karzai government is more credible than is sometimes said? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a critical question. Um, but again, impatience factors into it. Uh, you know, when I was in Iraq, particularly during the very difficult year of 2007, a um, lot of impatience with Prime Minister Maliki and kind of the refrain out of Washington was, why can't Maliki be more like Karzai? Because, um, you know, because that, that, that's kind of how it looked three years ago. 
and, and now you hear, well, why can't Karzai be more like Maliki? Uh, um, this is a crucial question. Uh, you have to have a credible partner. Um, you also have to be very careful in deciding that you do not have a credible partner. Um, and we tried that in Vietnam. You remember Diem. Uh, didn't, didn't end well for him or ultimately for us. Um, and, and again, uh, the notion that we can or should intervene to develop a more credible partner, um, uh, I think, is catastrophic. Um, again, we, we thought that was a good idea in getting rid of Mossadegh uh, in Iran in 1953, and that still haunts us. Uh, uh, so what to do about the Afghan government and uh, President Karzai? Um, first, take a deep breath, go out and sit under one of those trees, and, <laughs> and think about it. Uh, uh, look at it a bit from Karzai's perspective. I, I had the unique experience of arriving in Afghanistan um, uh, just after New Year's Day 2002 to open our embassy there. He had been in office all of 10 days. Uh, and we met to discuss what on earth we do now. Um, part of that discussion at one point was producing a breakfast napkin and sketching out what the new Afghan flag would look like. Uh, so from Karzai's perspective, uh, he has uh, had the hardest job in the world uh, uh, for eight and a half very long years. Uh, and all he's getting from his alleged ally is a ration of grief. Uh, uh, that's his perspective. Uh, there are obviously very genuine problems. Uh, here I think you have to look for trajectories. Uh, uh, however low the point or the points of the line may be, the real question is which way do they trend? Uh, uh, and again, I think you've got to be pretty clear-eyed about this. The, the big issue now with Afghanistan is corruption. The problem in Iraq uh, of corruption was absolutely huge when I was there. Uh, fortunately, the media focus uh, tended to be on other issues, basically the security issues. Uh, uh, as we wrestled with corruption, uh, we were able to do so without the glaring uh, media attention that we're now seeing in Afghanistan. Uh, so we got Maliki to do some pretty hard things. I think our ability to get him to do those things had a relationship to the uh, fact that he was not absolutely in the media spotlight on it. Um, um, so again, you got to figure out how to, how to shift the line, uh, even if it's from a very low base. Um, uh, you have to take the broad and long view uh, of who your partner is, what he's done, uh, and what his prospects are for the future. And when you look at things like the Afghan election, um, uh, again, it was interesting to me that uh, Americans seem to be a lot more upset about fraud in the Afghan election than, as far as I could tell, than Afghans were. Uh, what Afghans wanted was a government that could govern. Uh, uh, and if there were irregularities, obviously not a good thing. But the real issue is, uh, have you got the prospect for that good enough governance? Uh, uh, where you're going to have corruption, you're going to have irregularities. Um, but are you also seeing the other side of the ledger? And I think it's those indicators that one has to look at as one assesses our relationship with the Karzai government going forward. Thank you, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Thank you.